Welcome, friends, to the How To Heretic. I'm Uncle Mark. And I'm Uncle Dan. And I'm Uncle Doug. And this is your user's guide to life on the outside. Indeed. Leaving religion is the first step into a larger, better world. But it can also be a scary world. Ah. Things work differently now. Never fear. That's why we are here. We're your audio uncles. And with help from good friends and experts in all sorts of fields, we're going to share the stories and seek the knowledge to build a great life. After all, you only get one that we know of. So you better make the most of it. Fellow uncles. Hello. Oh. <laughs> The well that was a an, a, a well done pluralization. Um, we, I think there's a theme this week. An no. ac- there's, this is one of our accidental themes, and it the accidental theme this week is things uh, is brains that may or may not be working properly. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, right? Indeed. And yeah, Doug, you have a perfect example of one that is clearly not working properly. I am going to kick us off with a a, a, a little local celebrity. Um, not for any good reasons, a uh, kind of Mormon story that doesn't end in a, in a, in a body count. So actually quite a happy story. Well, it, may, it may doesn't have. end in a body count yet. It, the yeah, story exactly. is the not story. finished. There it is, is not over. There was an, uh, there was an allegation of a murder, oh. <laughs> but, uh, it kind of went nowhere. So yeah, and that's then true. I am going to talk about, uh, a person who, uh, everything seemed to be going fine with his brain until he was on the road to Milan. And then it, right. it wasn't anymore. He got a then, convertible. Then he was of two minds. <laughs> he got a convertible. <laughs> uh, and I am going to tell us uh, all about something that could happen to any of our brains. Yeah. And uh, and and we'll see how that goes. Yeah. And uh, and we'll find Jesus together and learn a little yeah. bit about ourselves. And Dan, you you have a little announcement on the on the show here. A little special sure, event. I, I, yes. I, I, Many of you know that I do another program called "Thank God I'm Atheist." Uh, you, you two uncles have frequented that show. A- our sister program, and 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 Frank has been on our show. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, because this is COVID times, and that's the worst timeline of all. Uh, hopefully, nobody is planning on going to any big parties Please for don't. New Year's Eve. Mm-hmm. Um, which sucks, but you know, don't risk your life just so that you can, you know, kiss somebody, uh, for no good reason. So, uh, what we're doing is a live stream that will, uh, the, 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 you know, we'll, sp- we're, we're going to spend three hours, uh, plus just <clears throat> jabbering away, having a good time. A lot of, uh, a lot of friends from various podcasts are going to be on and, you two uncles are going to join us. Yeah, at some point. Yeah, we will. We will old lang syne it together. Yeah, <clears throat> we'll have some bonhomie, some camaraderie, and uh, more importantly than ringing uh, in this next new year, this next year we will be ringing out this one. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Saying indeed. Adios to the most broken of all of the years that has ever occurred. Yeah. So we'll we'll as we get closer to that date, we'll tweet out and and you know, share information. So if you yeah, want we don't to join... have a full schedule yet, uh, but, but you know, this is a fun announcement and all of you, are, everyone's welcome to join. Um, and we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll have information to come. Yep. So with that, let's do a show. Yeehaw. Hey, uncle Mark. Well, hello. Uh, I, I am confused. Hmm. Are you confused? I, I am confused for indeed, for lo, I know not what Uncle Doug has in store what, for us. What he hath done. <laughs> yeah. What hath Doug wrought <laughs> yeah. in the world Forgive today. them, forgive them, Father. Yeah, I, Doug, has, Doug has a surprise on yeah. tap for us today. And, and it's because it is the first day of the Advent calendar, I think. And and one of the days of uh, of Hanukkah, so I'm pretty sure that it's the day that you blow out the candle and get a surprise from Uncle Doug. That's right. Well, I figured this because this subject is something quite well known to both of you. <clears throat> I oh, thought I would okay. surprise you on the air with it. Um, it's something we've been kicking around for a while, but it finally, you know, had its uh, the dreidel finally came up with the subject <laughs> on it. <clears throat> so come. <laughs> 
Uh, come with me, if you will, to the headier days of the late 1990s. Mm. We were so innocent then. <laughs> the prequels had yet to come out and ravage our childhood memories. And, and Donald Trump was just that loser enthusiastically pointing at a pile of meat. <laughs> no doubt to anyone under 30 or, or not from Utah, the name Super Del Shanzi will mean exactly oh, no. nothing. Oh, my God. <laughs> but those of us unlucky enough to recognize that name... I'm uh, confident I have just triggered a torrent of painful and stupid memories. Actually, I'm quite delighted by my memories of <laughs> Superdell. Well, you know how can how can we how can we miss him if he won't go away? Um, <laughs> he, more, more, kind of Mormon's late stage Mormonism's late stage Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. That's perfect. <clears throat> I don't know. Has Rudy ever kicked a bird? <laughs> Probably, <laughs> almost certainly. Um, I, Followed think- by a, a hilarious pratfall. <laughs> right. I've been thinking about talking about the rise and fall of Super Del Shanzi over... So he's the topic? <clears throat> I thought he was just a reference. Nope, he's the topic. <laughs> oh. We're talking okay. about Super Del Shanzi today. Let's fucking do this. Yay. Rock and roll, baby. Yeah, let's, let's, let's take our minds off of the plague for a few, a few minutes. Um, ever since we started the podcast, I've been thinking about talking about this guy. Because his story is so inextricably linked to Utah and the weird cloistered culture of the Mormon church that it could really only happen here, or so I thought. Um, uh. As I began uh, to piece together his bizarre and vaguely annoying life story, I began to see parallels in t- uh, to a life story, an attitude, and a demeanor of another improbable and annoying character. Let's see if you can guess who by the end. Now, <clears throat> this guy is still alive, and as we'll soon see, is no stranger to the court system. So under the advice of Andrew Torres, Esquire, I am going to tread carefully. Everything I'm about to say comes from news stories, court proceedings, and Shanzi's own mouth. Um, so I'll try to not get So you're s- asking us who else he sounds like by, by this description? Yes. Okay. We, you, you'll, you'll, I, I think it'll be somewhat obvious when we get to the end. Okay. Uh, Del Buck Shanzi was born in Ithaca, New York in 1969. Uh, he made his way to Utah at the age of 12 after his parents divorced. On his Facebook page, he claims to have skipped high school and gone directly to Cornell University. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I I know they'll let anybody into Cornell. Yeah. I could not find any evidence of this. um, It's it's totally skipped high school. Yeah, just went right into (laughs) Cornell. Not one day. Yeah. In 1996, at the age of 27, Shanzi founded Totally Awesome Computers. Oh. which is why any of us know his name. It was a completely forgettable PC sales repair and refurbishment company, utterly indistinguishable from the thousands of other PC shops popping up uh, at the time. Basically, every strip mall in America yeah, had a Next P- to the check cashing place. Precisely. Right? Uh, it was indistinguishable, indistinguishable except for one thing, its eccentric owner and his willingness to embarrass himself. Yes. Yeah. Shanzi embarked on a relentless and inescapable, inescapable ad campaign Featuring himself and his blonde flat top in all its riddle and fueled glory. <clears throat> These obnoxious ads were everywhere on local TV. As annoying as they were, and they were annoying, they were hard not to notice. And, and within a few years, they were paying huge dividends. Yeah, he was, and he, he was consciously obnoxious. Like he, to be he fair. Didn't, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't. But also, I mean, can we just point out the fact that the phrase... People, younger people might not know this, but even in the 90s, the phrase totally awesome was was done. Like, yeah, it was played he out. Had, he named his com- his computer company something that was like the rest of us were already like, wow. Yeah, where, where, so, where some great comedians kind of, you know, hone their skills on the road at little comedy clubs. Yeah. Dell's sense of humor was definitely honed at the MTC. Uh, exactly. He was far more carrot top than he was Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. <laughs> um, at its height, Totally Awesome Computers operated nine stores up and down the Wasatch Front and was estimated to be worth several million dollars. Shanzi poured even more, uh, more dollars into this Chinese water torture of an ad campaign, running ads during prime time, sporting events uh, before movies in theaters, and anywhere else you cared to look. Although Shanzi and his campaign predated YouTube and social media, this garbage went viral. <clears throat> Although when I say... Vi- and to be clear, he called himself Super Dell. Yeah. You introduced him as Super Dell Shanzi. He, that, was a, that was a self-given moniker. That's right. Yeah, that was not given by the, the, the super friends. That That's was, right. 
he like Napoleon, he crowned himself, right? That's yeah. exactly right. And although his crap went viral, when I say viral, I mean more like herpes, in the sense that they were painful, and embarrassing, never welcome, and nobody wanted to see more of them. But right. except for his ads and personality being brutally, uh, uh, brutally annoying, he seemed like Earth in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy to be mostly harmless. That, dear uncles, would turn out not to be true. Yeah. Uh, that, does that sound a little familiar about somebody? Anyway, flush with cash, Shanzi went big into paragliding in 2003. Uh, and f- <laughs> I love that to just that's the obvious track. Right, exactly. So he took up paragliding, and then in 2003, he founded Totally Awesome Guns and Range. It turns out that Shanzi was just a bit of a gun nut, and in what would evolve into an impressive rap sheet, Shanzi was charged with a concealed weapons violation in 1992. He publicized his gun business with the same crazed intensity as his computer business. The most famous ad, I don't know if you guys remember this, that he made for his gun business featured a young, obviously white woman cowering in her house as a dangerous intruder who was also white, only because I'm sure Shanzi didn't know any black people to put in the cast, <laughs> prowls around the house, scraping his Bowie knife along the bricks. No. When he no finally way. gets to the door and begins futzing with the lock, she opens up with the heretofore unseen fully automatic machine gun and then loads the whole clip on him. Jesus. <laughs> it was a nuanced message. Yeah. His subtlety was, his, was really his forte. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, just like McNaughton, these guys just do not get nuance and subtlety. No, the the only the only setting on their dial is eleven. Exactly. Yeah, that is so true of Shanzi. So it was at this time that he was at his zenith. He had two thriving businesses. He was a minor local celebrity, and he began parlaying that celebrity into new ventures, including a series of leadership DVDs, which oh, tr- try as I might, I could not find anywhere. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, I really oh, tried. We- Somebody send it to us. We it, need it. Please. Doug, sometimes if you go, like at night, if you go behind DI, <laughs> like there's bins that they don't even put garbage in. They're just things that they hope people oh will steal. You Nobody even knows what DI is outside of Utah. That's, that's the Mormon thrift store, you guys. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's hard to describe how much Superdell Shanzi was a product of the Mormon culture of Utah. Not only is that spastic enthusiasm rampant, But even the vernacular, like you said, Dan, totally freaking awesome, man, is so part of Mormon culture. Add to that that Utah has some of the highest rates of fraud and personal bankruptcy in the country, and you have the perfect environment for a huckster and egomaniacal dingleberry like (laughs) Shanzi. There is a particular kind of arrogance to certain Mormon men as well. After a lifetime of being convinced that they are the most righteous and worthy beings on the planet, that you can just see in spades in Shanzi. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, they have magic powers too. Don't forget. That's right, and and a little magic vial of olive oil. <laughs> we <laughs> yep. ever talked about that? We should. We should. Um, we'll get to yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, as we're about to see, this arrogance and self righteousness would cause Shanzi to fly his paraglider a little too close to the sun. <laughs> Cracks began to show in the totally awesome computer empire when, in 2003, his former vice president and former friend. Uh, William May sued Shanzi, claiming that because he, May, was not Mormon, Shanzi had passed him over for raises and promotions. The suit was set... I, I, it is a probably 100% true. Right. Oh, it's got to be true. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, the suit was settled out of court, but Shanzi's legal troubles were just beginning. How did Shanzi make a non-Mormon friend? I know. <laughs> and, and, and where did he find one in, you know, southern Salt Lake or northern Utah County? Yeah, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, that same year he was, fought, he was uh, sued by another former employee for defamation, which ended up being dismissed. But it turns out that employee, Sherry Young, also alleged financial shenanigans, and before long the IRS began an audit of totally awesome computers and totally awesome guns and range. Uh-oh. Then in that two- might be less than totally awesome. <clears throat> yep. Then in 2005, Shanzi got into a confrontation with a group of neighbors over his driving. God, I remember this. It appears that in what would turn out to be a lifelong effort to overcompensate for something, Shanzi would drive his black Jaguar at high speeds through his sleepy neighborhood. This had gotten so bad that finally a coalition of his neighbors confronted him. The confrontation got hot, and one of his neighbors picked up a rock and threatened to break his taillights, which caused Shanzi to pull out a gun and threaten them. The police were called, because even in America, you can't point your gun at your neighbors, by the time the police got there, Shanzi had well, these been... are all white people. We should, we should probably... Yeah, and I'm sure the question is yeah. going to get asked is how does this guy continue to not be in prison? And there's, I don't know. 
but we'll, we'll I don't know. We'll talk <laughs> about it. It's not for lack of trying. Well, this is America, and he does have money, or has had, anyway. Does he? So, um, so when the police finally showed up, surround, uh, Shanzi had been surrounded by even more fed-up neighbors, uh, and he railed to the press, quote, this was a very simple case of frickin' psycho road ragers. They decided to be really nice once they knew I was armed. Their whole personalities changed. It was amazing. Adding... <laughs> It's just astronomically, ludicrously insane to tell the community that it's not okay to defend yourself. So, what? Yeah. He, well, he claims that he was defending himself. He was the victim. Yeah. I feel like there were so many, there were so many totally awesome double, double negatives in that. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine how shitty a neighbor you must be for the neighborhood to like coalesce around that? Yeah. Anyway. Um, all th- yes, I can imagine it. it I, I've had time, some shitty know. neighbors, but we have never gotten to the point of pitchforks and torches before. <laughs> right. Like maybe just a note. Like, like hey, guys. Yeah. yeah. Uh, although a jury would later find Shanzi not guilty of the brandishing charge, he would be found guilty of lying to the police and misdemeanor speeding. This incident was the beginning of the end of his two businesses. Shanzi had found himself enmeshed in a web of ethics complaints, lawsuits, an IRS audit, and now criminal behavior. It seems the good people of Utah had finally had enough of this live action gritty, and Shanzi was forced to... <laughs> Don't you dare besmirch gritty. Hero, hero of the revolution. <laughs> so Shanzi was finally forced to close his... It's guns. a live action Cosmo, maybe. That's a <laughs> deep cut right there. Let's see. He closed his gun store in 2005, followed by all nine of his computer stores in 2006. At the oh. announcement of his company's demise, Shanzi railed at reporters saying, quote, it's too bad that all of you in the media in Utah are liars and murderers. <laughs> what? <laughs> you just destroyed the greatest computer company of all time. We are the... Murderers? <laughs> <laughs> we, are the wow. we are the best in the world. The world champion. All this hatred was created by you. You're basically angels of Satan. I had nine storefronts that fixed shitty PCs in a fucking flyover square state. Yeah. I was the greatest. <laughs> Does that remind you of somebody? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, now, <clears throat> with the collapse of his two businesses, his public persona now fully passed its sell-by date, and legal and financial problems mounting, I think we all felt we were, being, we were about to be free from the public nuisance that was Super Del Shanzi. Yeah. We were wrong. We were wrong. So, can, I, can I just say that... As a bit of foreshadowing, when I started to Google him, the drop down in the Google search thing it said Del. I, I typed in Del S C H, and there he is, Del Shanzi. <laughs> and underneath his name is a word that shocked me, which is uh, what you're about to say. Yeah, yeah. What is it, so Doug? What is it? It's it's politician. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, uh, some you have po- to win an election to be a politician. Uh. You have to do yeah. You have to be believable as a human being exactly. to be a politician. Well, somewhere along the way, Shanzi got into the aforementioned paragliding, and when I say got into it, I mean he became obsessed. Now I am not going to bag on parag- uh, paragliding in general. It looks like a perfectly pleasant pastime, except to say. If you've ever been around a group of paragliders, it's pretty fucking annoying. It's like every one of your neighbors decided to mow their lawns at the same time early on a Saturday while you're nursing a hangover. And in any case, Shanzi was going to do for paragliding what Donald Trump has done for golf. At some point, Shanzi found that his paragliding company, I tried to find out more about this company, which is apparently now named U-Turn USA. Mm -hmm. But in looking for it, I did a Google search for totally awesome paragliders, and the first hit... (laughs) totallyawesome.com up slash paramotor and this is true takes you to an online pharmacy selling discount Viagra out of Canada nice <laughs> excellent <laughs> okay hey, can you say that again so, let me just write that down. <laughs> in any event in 2006 only months after his incident with his neighbors if an, in an effort to gin up sales Shanzi flew his paraglider way low over the freeway during rush hour traffic possibly causing a minor accident this, stu- this stunt ended up with even more charges for Shanzi, to which he ended up pleading no contest. To be clear, he's not just doing paragliding, which is just with the sail. He's doing the thing where you strap the, the fan on your back, yeah. and then you can, you can tootle around like you're a, 
like a, a, a single engine uh, exactly airplane. And yeah, so you have a little more up and downy control. I think it's and paramotor. Pa- as there's there's to yeah there's like paraglide. I, it kind of is interchangeable in all the reading I did. But you're mm-hmm. absolutely right, Dan. It's the it's the thing. it's the annoying one. He's not going to do the one that isn't annoying. Exactly. Right. That's exactly right. Uh, it should come as no surprise that Chauncey has not ended up uh, endearing himself to the paragliding or paramotoring community. <laughs> Among other shenanigans, he created the World Powered Paragliding Association, Association, or WPPGA, which he claims tests and certif- certifies paragliding equipment and records. This made-up association, unsurprisingly, has certified only one paraglider that meets its exacting standards. I wonder who. Shanzi's own brand, the Flat Top Paraglider. Oh, my God. <laughs> Such a twist. <laughs> In 2000... Why would you... I love that he named a, uh, a, a, a company after his bad haircut. I know. That, again, was you know, over long before the 90s. Uh, in 2008, Shanzi felt as though he had not inflicted himself sufficiently on the public. So as Uncle Dan said, he began first of several quixotic political campaigns, first for mayor of Salt Lake County, then for governor of Utah as a libertarian on a platform yeah. Yeah, on a platform of banning abortions, expanding gun rights, and restoring freedom. I love the idea of a libertarian being about banning something I know. primarily. Exactly. Shanzi accused then Governor John Huntsman of being an antichrist socialist. Okay. Oh my god. The the son the son and heir of one of the one of the West most richest industrialists yeah and yeah, most conservative yeah. le, you know legacies although John Huntsman's not the most conservative of conservatives but no yeah um, so more on that particular campaign in a few minutes uh, in that same year Shanzi was charged and convicted of reckless driving and seatbelt violations stemming from an incident where he swerved into oncoming traffic causing a driver to swerve off the road into construction oh my cones. God. Turns out that that driver happened to be Officer Michael Paletta driving home from work in an unmarked police car. Oh, no. When he pulled Shanzi over, Shanzi's wife and two children were in the back seat. Two of his other children were in the front seat sharing one seat belt, and Shanzi was unbuckled. Uh, he claimed he was swerving his car to make the kids laugh, but he swerved into oh oncoming traffic. <laughs> I know. This guy. Re- re- that was his, I mean. Yes. The, 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 hooray he, for... Uh, Radical honesty, I guess. They were going the, to get ice the cream, and didn't Daddy makes immediately it... call. Didn't immediately call call Child Protective Services know, to come get real. the kids. Uh, he was again arrested in 2011 <clears throat> in Astoria, Oregon, for parachuting off the Astoria column. He at first got away with it, but then posted video of it on YouTube, leading to his arrest. Classic. Turns out that his uh, vanity would come back to bite him again. In 2013, and this may be why some other people besides Utahns know of this guy. Video appeared on YouTube of a man pursuing a migrating owl in a paraglider or paramotor for several minutes before finally twice kicking the exhausted bird. The man can be heard screaming, who's the predator? And I just kicked the owl in the backside. Oh, my God. The video is. Did he actually say backside? He actually said backside because he can't say ass. God, I can. What a fucking ass. (laughs) At least he's not a, a, a total Mormon hypocrite. Well. (laughs) <laughs> uh, the video is awful. You can watch the terrified bird grow weaker and weaker as this douchebag and his stupid lawnmower powered overcompensator laughing like a fucking jackass. Yep, chase it down until he finally <laughs> kicks it. The video was apparently posted by Shanzi himself on YouTube, not knowing or perhaps not caring that knowingly using an aircraft to harass wildlife and pursuing a migratory bird are both misdemeanors. And it was an endangered owl, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was an endangered owl. Federal prosecutors, uh, not generally known for their sense of humor, charged Shanzi, and in 2014, U.S. Magistrate Judge uh, Brooke Wells ordered that, as a condition of his pretrial release, all guns be removed from Shanzi's house. (laughs) (laughs) It's hard to imagine the dark corners of a mind like Shanzi's, especially when confronted by the federal government actually coming for your guns. Right, yeah. But even still, his response was, let's say, unexpected. <clears throat> Shanzi had interrupted the judge several times during the hearing, and although she repeatedly asked him to stay quiet, she suffered his idiocy with calm dignity. Then in response to or- her order, Shanzi yelled out, quote, Are you aware that a human head was thrown through my, f- my picture window? <laughs> <laughs> I seem to remember that. I seem- wow, I- that's imp- 
that is an impressive thing to bring out in court. Uh, certainly. How's that for an October surprise? <laughs> if it <Rudy>? pleases the court. <laughs> After a long pause, Judge Wells said that she actually was not aware of such an incident and, and uh, cut him off as he tried to explain further, saying that random shot putting of severed heads would not affect the conditions of his pre-tri- pretrial release. <laughs> right. When questioned outside the courtroom about his run in with the headless horseman, Shanzi uh, uh, railed at the credulous reporters, quote, I'm telling you the truth. You guys are liars. Nothing you say is true. Sound familiar? <laughs> The irony yeah. of this is that the absolute best way to describe Shanzi's physical appearance is Ichabod Cranish. <laughs> Shanzi ran for mayor of Saratoga Springs in 2010 and again for governor in 2012 and 2016, this time in the independent American party because the Republican party had gotten too liberal for him. Yeah, the Utah Republican party. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Uh, in January, uh, on January 2nd of 2019, Dell was charged with shooting his gun within 600 feet of a neighbor's house. Uh, he had set up a target practice range in his backyard. and He's a menace, this He's guy. a public menace. A fucking menace. Uh, cops could hear the gunfires. They, you know, they were approaching. Uh, and, and neighbors said so they could hear bullets whizzing over their heads. Um, during the trial, prosecutors listed many of his run-ins with the law, to which Shanzi responded that his record reads like, quote, a record of awesomeness. And that he was being, quote, uh, a hero in the community. Wow. So that kind of brings us up to now. Like I said at the beginning, in my mind, this story could only really happen in Utah. But as I read up on this litigious, self-promoting fabulist with a towering ego and a series of wrecked businesses and disgruntled business partners in his wake who has aspiring uh, aspirations to public office on a far-right platform, something occurred to me. I'm not saying that Super Del Shanzi is, is what Donald Trump would be if he hadn't been born rich. I'm saying that Super Del Shanzi is what Donald Trump Jr. would be if he hadn't been born rich. Uh, yes. Uh, and here's the thing. In 2008, he got something like 25,000 votes. Oh, my for, God. In, in, for, in, for governor? For governor. Oh, my God. Uh, and, I mean, you know, we're a state of three, four million people, however many, but still. Uh, and if both 2016 and 2020 have taught us anything, we are stupid enough to elect a guy like this. Oh, yeah. So I mean, not we. We're stupid enough to elect much very different guys, but we as a, as a state. Yes. Not, not we uncles. That's correct. I mean the royal we. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's basically it, except for one little anecdote that I, I, I have been assured by counsel we are able to talk about on the air. And it just gives a fine little code of this story. Back in 2008, Uncle Mark had, had left the country to work on a, a project and forgotten to secure his absentee ballot. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. Are we telling this story? We're telling the story. I, are we sure? I, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I've been assured by counsel we're okay about this. Um, okay, so let, 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 let me clarify. I was, I was in Georgia. I was, oh, in, okay. I was in Atlanta. Oh, that's right. And I had so that, that's out of the country. That qualifies. yeah. And I was listening to it's in the Confederacy, and I was listening to um, the, the local Utah NPR station, and it was the run up to Obama's first uh, election, right? Yep. A huge historic fucking thing, and yep. we're I, Doug and I are very political, and we're very excited about it. But I'm also an idiot, so I'm listening to the radio, and it says, oh, t- like tomorrow or the next day is your last day to." Um, uh, register your, for your absentee ballot in Utah. Well, I was in fucking Georgia. Right. So I panicked. And I said, I, I can tell this, right, Doug? Yeah, of course. And so I was like, fuck, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I'm like, oh, Doug and I look a lot alike. You guys know we sound a lot alike. Not that the clerk knows what we sound like. So I said, okay, Doug, I'm going to FedEx you my passport. And all I need you to do is go to the clerk's office and just register for a, an absentee ballot for me. That's it. Right. Right? Yep. So that's all I asked you to do. I just want to go on record. That's all I asked you to do. <laughs> well, so I, no problem. I got this. I'm, I'm consider myself to be, you know, kind of 007-ish. So I took your ID and I went to, I went to register for an absentee ballot. And Double I, D7. With, I put down my, uh, your ID and I'm like, I'd like to register for an absentee ballot. And the woman's like, well, why don't you just vote now? <laughs> and I just kind of looked at her and I'm like, okay. <laughs> what was like, it, would be, it would be weirder if you were just like, oh, no, I'll take the absentee ballot. I, exactly. I'm like, that's going to seem really strange. So I'm like, uh, okay. 
So she hands, I'm like, fuck it, I'm just going to do this. So she hands me the form, <laughs> and it says at the top, name, and I write, Doug. <laughs> I immediately just crumple the form up slowly and look at her and I'm like, can I have another form, please? <laughs> he fucked up his own name. Like, that, they should have known right then. I know. Oh, my so God. So she gave me this kind of side eye but gave me another form and I filled it out with the correct name or the incorrect name. And then I walked in to the room and you, you had to hand your ID to the person as you walked in the room. And the woman took the ID and she said, oh, it's almost your birthday. And I said, no, it's not. I mean, yes, it is. <laughs> oh, my God. God. You are the worst 007. So, <laughs> you might be the dumbest spy on a, exactly. of all time. At this, Clouseau. at this point, I am sweating. My mouth is dry. <laughs> I'm like, I am going to be in jail by the end of the day. So, and I'm just at work being like, loop, 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 loop. <laughs> oh, my God. So I, f- I managed to get in there. I voted for Obama. But as, as my vengeance for, for almost ending up in jail, I made Uncle Mark cast a vote for Super Del Shanzi for governor. <laughs> 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 I just a perfect wow. cap to that stupid fucking story. Oh, my God. So oh my God. If, any, if anyone in the federal uh, government's listening, I guess this will be our last podcast. But uh, Right. But yeah, just remember, I'm not the one who committed the crime. That's right, right. right. It was me. Uh, and and also, that was just a fake story, and uh, and and it was just for fun, <laughs> and we were just kidding. Uh, so that's it, my confession. Well, that's Holy all right. shit! That, that was a totally awesome story, Doug. You're welcome. <laughs> Super Dell 2024. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, look look up his. Maybe we'll find a, uh, a a video of one of his commercials and throw it into the show notes, oh, just god, so that people us. can have something to. To, to chew on while they while they he looks imagine. exactly like you think he looks. Yep, exactly. Yep. And the it's like humor Revenge is... of the Nerds meets uh, uh, Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, let's yeah. let's get out and of this. His humor is amazing. Yep. Okay, bye. Uncle Dan, hello. There are certain characters in our culture, yeah. our global culture, that are more laudable than others. Like Super Del Shanzi. Like Super Del Shanzi. Or and less me. laudable. <laughs> More or less. And and they have a distinction that sets them apart. And it's imposed by a guy in a funny hat on a little gold chair. That's right. It is right? Santa. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Mark, I believe you have one of these yeah, so you important know important characters. Used to I I had a real bummer of a story last week, so uh you did. I sure did. And uh so this week I resolved to do something a little light on the sadness and institutionalized torture and focus on a silly fun little story about an almost comically weird murder. <laughs> oh, hooray. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, a guy got killed, but we're going to have some fun with it anyway. So, <clears throat> Did you guys see the article from the Jerusalem Post where the uh, former head of Israeli, uh, the Israeli Space Agency, quick note, Israel has a space agency. That's new information. Excited to see their first manned launch wander for 40 years on its way to the moon. <laughs> anyway, he, he claimed that we, or anyway, they, the Israelis, have been contacted by emissaries from the Galactic Federation. Yes. Uh, but we're told to keep mum about it and uh, because humanity isn't ready to know that. So naturally, the Israelis told it to that famously incorruptible steel trap of secret keeping, Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> right. So incidentally, yeah. that article is on the front page of the Jerusalem Post next to an article assuring people that the Utah monolith is not, in fact, the work of aliens. <laughs> oh, my God. What's, what's funny about that is that it's a story about aliens and, uh, and, and sort of galactic nonsense, and the least believable thing about it is that Trump kept a secret. Oh, my God. He would have, <laughs> exactly. he would have told it as he was walking out of the room. So uh, 2020, you're really letting it all hang out, babe. But, <clears throat> so that's pretty nuts and amazing if true. Uh, but because my brain is nothing if not an amusing mess, I naturally wondered what those aliens, uh, those alien allianceers have been observing about us to make their determinations. And as an art school dropout, I thought, obviously, what if the only fruits by which they have come to know us was Catholic hagiographic art, the <laughs> art of the saints and their martyrdom? You follow? <laughs> so years, years ago, or maybe just last February, which is kind of the same thing. I found myself standing in the long gallery of the Italian Renaissance in the Louvre in Paris. 
uh, you know, when Americans could leave their homes and, and go that far. And while I was being buffeted and body checked, this is true, by busloads of elderly tourists <laughs> racing past the stunning masterworks of one of the greatest periods of European art so they could take a photo of a far less remarkable small brownish portrait of a lady. Right. <clears throat> My gaze was focused on a beautiful, almost life-size painting of a pale woman of some nobility kneeling in what looks like a beautiful Italian villa opening to a pleasant landscape and standing next to her is an even more pale, nay, I would say ghastly gray man, a monk, in fact, with a sizable machete deeply embedded in his skull. <laughs> <laughs> I love this painting. I, it's called St. Uh, Peter Martyr and Kneeling Donor by Ambrogio Borgognon from 1494. And I think he was also the first painter of the beef. Um, <laughs> I tweeted it out earlier this week that all these years later, I still think about that, that painting all the time. And then I was wondering what aliens would make of it when I suddenly realized I knew nothing of St. Peter the Martyr or of the series of unfortunate events that led, to, led him to be portraited in such a manner. So I took my machete and started hacking away. <clears throat> For those who are new to the show and or have exactly zero contact with Catholicism, its art and its very particular obsessions uh, uh, with murdered believers are a big deal, most especially ones that died in the line of Catholicing, you know, spreading the word, defending the faith, et cetera, et cetera. Right. When a person dies in such a manner, there is kind of a silly but also a real process by which that person may be declared a saint by whatever pope is sitting on the throne of Peter at that given moment. And saints are sort of minor gods. I know, I know you're saying, but Uncle Mark, Catholics are monotheists. But are they really? Yeah. <clears throat> when you have a god with three heads, but also separate, but really mostly together in their separateness. And uh, uh, Jesus's mom is really the most powerful of a legion of over 10,000 officially recognized saints to whom you may pray for some very specific help. Monotheism, more like megatheism, if you ask me. <laughs> Look out, you Hindus, with your 33 million gods. The Catholics are coming for you. <laughs> yeah. um, and also because of the Catholic belief in things like blood, blood magic, transubstantiation, the resurrection of Jesus, and the kind of weird one of Lazarus, etc., there is an obsession with death and flesh and blood that your standard American Protestant looks at as deeply weird, as does your friendly neighborhood atheist. We've talked about a lot of those ideas on the show, and I don't want to waste too much time calling out episode numbers. But in brief, for transubstantiation, check out episode 24. And for a real whale of a tale involving a tiny chunk of a very holy person, check out the Holy Prepuce segment in episode 126. <laughs> or just for <clears throat> the gruesome insanity of it, try St. Denis carrying his own severed head in episode 34, or maybe the cadaver synod in 59. Catholicism is wonderfully, terribly morbid. Uh, the three of us, as amateur, maybe by now, pr uh, semi-pro students of all the bloody and bewildering business of the saints, are sort of amateur hagiographers. Hagiography being the study and writing about and veneration of the Catholic saints. Maybe just not the last part, the veneration. But you can call us <laughs> hagia hobbyists, how about? <clears throat> <laughs> so anyway, the hagiogra hagiographic study of St. Peter the Martyr, or St. Peter of Verona if you're nasty, led me to some strange, gruesome, and hilarious anecdotes of his supposed life. Born sometime in 1206, this gentleman of Verona showed two desirable talents, a deep love of Jesus, preaching his word, and an almost fanatical devotion to the Pope. Oh, wait, shit, that's three. Such were his gifts that he was welcomed into the Dominican order uh, at the tender age of 15. His main obsession after the Jesus was something very close to our hearts here on the show, heresy. <laughs> and what was the particular flavor of heresy haunting the lovely hills of Tuscany and Lombardy at the time? Why, that of the Cathars, of course. Villains. Oh, yes. Boo, the Cathars. <laughs> so, in short, the Cathars were a weird and super interesting form of neo-Manichaeans. Um, Doug told us about the Manichaeans in episode 137. Uh, the Cathars were an evolution of that Eastern-infused Manichaean idea of dualism, where everything is either sacred or evil, to the Cathars, the material world and everything in it was evil. And man, sort of an alien being passing through, was essentially sacred. <clears throat> they also believed that the Jesus was not really the son of the Almighty God, 
but an angel that pulled a Chris Angel mind freak. Hey, Chris, AMF, thanks for your continued support. <laughs> um, Chris Angel level mind, uh, 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 magic trick with his crucifixion and didn't really suffer and die at all. Pretty weird stuff. Definitely not beloved of the Vatican at the time, <laughs> right. who was at that moment leaning pretty heavily on the levers of various inquisitions. <clears throat> So it was against these kind of medieval New Agers, the not yet St. Peter set his sights, but not before a little time out. It seems he was accused by some busybodies lost to history of letting persons, including women persons, Ruh -roh. unaccompanied into his chambers after Dominican business hours. What? Uh-huh. And for this, for this great shame, he was banished to some crummy outpost in the hills, where despite his humiliation, one story says it did please him because he felt his punishment brought him closer to the suffering of the Jesus. So, oh, lovely. <clears throat> cool beans. Somehow, he was totally exonerated a short time later uh, from uh, his alleged nocturnal indiscretions and was welcomed back to Verona by his fellow friars. I'm of just impressed that you found a, a non-gay priest. Well, it, did, it said some of them were women. Oh, okay. There you uh. go. That, yeah, I that, think he was very. I think he was. He, I think he was a non-binary uh, saint, which is uh, that's something new. There you go. Um, so anyway, a recharged Peter was the toast of Tuscany. His sensational sermonizing and anti-heretical harangues made crowds react like teenage girls when the Beatles turned left at Greenland and found America. It was pandemonium. Stories of Peter ha uh, have him being nearly crushed by onrushing anti-heresy groupies and at times having to be borne up above the maddening crowd on a litter by several strong men's. <laughs> so impressed was Pope Gregory, ninth of his name, that he made Peter the head of the local Inquisition so he could bring some real-world applications to his anti-Cathar mouth-frothing. Um, a good time was not had by all. <clears throat> Which brings us to the first of his many miracles. Uh, it seems one day he was quite late to one of his rallies leaving his hashtag M, uh, uh, Mava, make Verona great again, fans <laughs> languishing in the hot Italian midsummer sun. Upon arriving, one of those dastardly Cathars scolded him for his rudeness, gesturing to the parched and sunburnt crowd. Uh, the, the heretical Cathar asked Peter to summon the cooling shade of a cloud to relieve his devotees. <laughs> Confident as fuck, Peter agreed to do so if the Cathar and his comrades would cast off their heresy and beg God forgive, for forgiveness, realizing they had caught him in a trap. They did so. And then the totally unusual event of an overcast sky occurred. <laughs> Miracles! <clears throat> His next miracle was a bit of a boo-boo, and it's really on him. One impassioned uh, teenage uh, boy from Verona, no, not the one you're thinking of, made his confession to the rock star friar. <clears throat> he told Peter he had in a fit of pique, kicked his mother. Mm. Oh, dear. Hoping to drive home uh, the gravity of violating the fifth commandment, Peter exaggerated for effect and told the lad it would be better that his foot was cut off than to commit so grievous an offense. Being both a teenager and Italian, the drama was strong with him. <laughs> <clears throat> the youth went home, found a blade, and hacked off his own foot. My God. Uh, oh, dear. When he When he learned... Of this strange cry for help, Peter rushed to the boy with hot tears of guilt, held the foot up to the stump, made the sign of the cross, and boom, good as new. Oh, uh, great. <clears throat> I think we've all learned a little bit about respecting each other, our parents, <laughs> and ourselves too, Peter surely said before the freeze frame high five and the end credits. <laughs> <laughs> How about one more miracle? Okay, okay. So in the frescoes of, in the Basilica, St. Ust Ustorgio, that were uncovered uh, in 1952, a very weird scene involving St. Peter was revealed. It seems the goodly churchgoers of 1200 and whatever were shocked to discover the Basilica statue of Mary and the baby Jesus had become animate and were, so, yes, and were spouting Cathar heresies. Peter was summoned. He arrived carrying a secret weapon. When he asked who was haunting the statue, the spirit responded that it was Jesus and his mother Mary, of course. Then Peter produced his secret weapon. He had just delivered a mass, and he had tucked a little cracker in his cassock. He presented the consecrated little slice of Christ to the statue, which instantly grew horns, both mother and child, no longer so tender and mild, 
and he cast the Manichaean mannequin Mephistopheles back to hell. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. That I was, was hoping crazy. it was going to be Chuck E. Jesus. It kind of almost was. So That's some showmanship right there. That's I would... I would pay to see that. Yeah, this guy's yeah that's got a good, some... that, that, that sounds like a good, a good show for sure. So on the Miracle Scorecard, that's climate, surgical reattachment, and ghost busting. <laughs> Something like for it. everyone. Well, maybe not everyone. It seems Peter, Peter's anti-Cathar crusade and the Inquisition he had been put in charge of prosecuting against them got noticed by the Cathars. Uh, at the height of his statue-saving statue powers, the Cathars put out a hit on him. Like, how much more Italian could this story get, you guys? <laughs> so Peter, the about to be the be martyr, was traveling from Como to Milan when he and his traveling companion were beset by two hired machetes, uh, one named Carino of Balsamo and his accomplice, the magnificently named Manfredo Clitoro. <laughs> <laughs> On April 26, 1252. Uh, Carino leapt from the, sh uh, the shrubbery and struck the mid-martyred Peter on the head with his machete, or what the Italians called a flaccion, which I prefer. Um, subdividing the top third in an instant, Peter fell to his knees and using his open cranium as an inkwell, wrote the first words of the Apostles' Creed, Credo and Diem, in the dirt in his own blood, translated as I believe in God. Uh, he dipped his pen in his head? His finger. Oh, my God. Ooh. I don't know if it dipped. I think it was bleeding pretty profusely. I think it was, there was plenty of ink on the ground. Um, <clears throat> uh, seeing he had not finished the job, Carino stabbed him in the chest before fleeing, leaving Peter unable to finish his gruesome writing assignment. Uh, despite his serious and fatal head wound, he is the Usain Bolt of the Saints, holding the world speed record from death to sainthood, that being just 11 months. Really? Wow. Yeah. They, of all the saints, of over 10,000. His feast day is April 6th. Oh, wait. No, it's April 29th. Oh, shit. It's also June 4th <laughs> because Catholicism is both really old and a hot mess. <clears throat> and despite his former importance uh, and world speed record in sainting, he is the patron saint of three and three things only. Those being the San Juan suburb of Guaynabo, Puerto Rico. Sure. Sure. Midwives. Whoa. And, <laughs> And for some, for some reason, and that ever-expanding employment sector of the gig economy, inquisitors. <laughs> <laughs> so, for the cultural benefit of our new galactic overlords, there are plenty more paintings of the cleaved Peter the Martyr to judge us by. In Giovanni Bellini's 1509, The Murder of St. Peter the Martyr, Peter, skull already split, lays on the ground while a 13th century Italian knight plunges a dagger into his starched white nightshirt. In Pedro uh, Berguete's version, the saint stands alone in a modest hallway, a tasteful small flaccione in his brain, holding a book and a thrice-crowned palm frond uh, very calmly. <laughs> what it, you want is some reading material. If you're going to be if you're going to be macheted in the head, yeah, bring a book. I mean, if you've only got a few minutes left, make the most of it, right? <laughs> in Alessandro Banvicino de, Moret, de Moretto's 1533 version, the assassin Carino uh, readies to deliver the death blow while cherubs and an angel wait excitedly just overhead, not to prevent Peter's murder, but to deliver him the crown of sainthood after it's over. Oh, <laughs> and yay. they look quite pleased. How are they going to put the crown on his head with that? <laughs> I, I think you just hang it on like a, like a coat hook. You just you take the flap that's been opened up and you just push it back on. The crown holds everything in place. It's <laughs> yeah, actually you good. Just snap the crown in half and stick it on each side of the machete. Um, and in my favorite, Fra Angelico's ghastly slasher film version from his St. Peter Martyr altarpiece, a Turkish-looking fellow in red is reenacting the shower scene from Psycho in the top of Peter's head with a carving knife as blood gushes out everywhere. <clears throat> uh, it is my working hunch, based solely on my supposition, that the emissaries of the Galactic Federation, observing only the Catholic hagiographic uh, uh, martyrdom art of the Italian Renaissance, contacted one of the three members of the Italian space agency. I mean, the other two are just part-time and said, nah, you guys aren't ready for this next level shit. Here's a monolith to hold you over for a bit. <laughs> Let us know when you're done with magic weathermen uh, with machetes in their heads. Bye. <laughs> so that's Peter, the martyr of Verona guys. Saints wow. collect the whole set. That is yeah. fantastic. Yes, in, indeed. And yeah. this one's nice because, uh, because when you, when you buy the candle, 
you can just you you just lop off the first the the top third of the wick. That's right. To, and when the whole when the whole body is melted, you have a tiny machete to collect. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. There's prizes for the kids. So that's it. Uh, it's uh, bloody stuff. Enjoy. Oh, that's hooray! Great. Let's move on. Gentlemen, hello. We uh, we here. Uh, we do this show. We w- right now we're all sitting alone in rooms, just talking toward little black things. Uh, but we're trying to entertain the masses, is what we're trying to do. Yeah, and uh, and some of the masses appreciate it so much that they have gone to howtoheretic.com. They've clicked the support us dinghy. And they have given us some money. So we have some folks to thank. Uh, our newest patrons are Scopy, uh, Georgie, Spinoza's Godzilla, and uh, Uncle Mark. I believe you have someone very special to thank. Uh, I do. <clears throat> I do. We have a very special, a very, this is a very special episode of Blossom. <laughs> and we have a very special friend who's been with us for a long, long time, and he's been on all of our um, live streams and everything. He is in uh, Hong Kong, I believe, is how Ooh. that's said. Yeah, and he's a the Hongest of all of the Kongs. <clears throat> but he has de- he has decided it is time for to to grant himself a heaven via We awesome. Uncles Three. So it, it is. We're, we're nothing if not easily bought. <laughs> we are so easily bought. And again, we've talked about this before. There's a price to make this stop, right? <laughs> so if Mormon Inc. or Scientology or whoever, if you want to make it stop, give us a call. Um, anyway, so to enshrine our friend Paul, I have, I've, I have rolled the bones and here is your heaven, Paul, starting now, your heaven. Dearest Paul, in a day far from now, when you breathe your last Having found yourself on the losing end of a bet in an underground canasta game with washed up, methed out old Olympic mascots who run you to ground outside Pusan and beat you to death with one of those weirdly oversized nutcrackers. I mean, you knew this was going to happen when you got mixed up with high stakes canasta, right? You will ascend to your forever repose in a place of unending, always renewing bucolic beauty. That's right, Paul. When you awake, free of the searing pain from the blunt force nutcracker trauma, Your eyes are struck by multiple camera flares in the dusty light. You find yourself laying in tall golden grass, waving lazily around you. Billowy Rococo clouds drift through the azure sky above. You set up with far more ease than you remember. Your body, last seen shattered by methed-out mascots, is stronger than you remember, like Gaston strong. And in fact, your Gaston-like chest strains your plunging uh, linen peasant shirt, And your pantaloons look painted on your legs as they plunge into your knee-high tattered boots. A song catches your ear. Why, it's the joyful work song of your fellows, the sturdy and hale peasants you now seem to be in the company of. Come, Paul. Come, there is much to be done, they shout. And up you leap, your eternal body bursting with the strength and vigor. Uh, With strength and vigor, it seems there is a field what needs a scything. And though you had never scythed on this side of the veil, by gum you can scythe, Paul. Whole acres of wheat fall fall to your swing as robust women rush behind you uh, to tie them in bundles, just like in a Bruegel's painting. <clears throat> What's this? Dear heavens, a whole vineyard in need of harvest. And, and, uh, and so you all set to it with gusto, singing tra-la-la-la hey and hey tra-la-la-la the whole time. And dear God, what utility your massive manly feet have, stomping the grapes in the golden light of afternoon with a comely lass in the, big, in the great big stompy thing, whatever that is. Uh, as everyone claps along, singing tra la 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 hey. The wagons loaded, the barrels full, the oxen fed. You and your new companions sit at rough tables and devour bread and potatoes and beer as the sun sets. Uh, the, the cutlery dances on the tables as you all pound out the rhythm of hey tra la tra la uh, as the dancing begins. You must admit, after a life staring at a laptop and rushing to meet deadlines, This day of honest, sustaining toil and camaraderie was a fine day indeed. Hey, Paul, hey, Paul, your companions shout, waking you from your your repose in the tall golden wheat. Wait, what the? You leap up and see them pulling empty wagons toward bursting fields and vines. But didn't we just do those yesterday, you mutter? But the singing begins, and who are you to let your scythe fall silent during a chorus of tra-la-la-la-hey? 
<laughs> and every day is this day, tra la 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 hey day, in the hay, singing hey tra la la hey, <laughs> dear Paul, the abundance and camaraderie and the work like the harvest never ever ends. In this, your very own joyously rural heaven from which there is no respite and no escape. Oh. <laughs> That's more of a tra la 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 hey. <laughs> So I just hey. I just think it's important to everyone to understand that most of these are based on my work dreams, <laughs> <laughs> right? Except now, yeah. not, now my dreams are just being in places where nobody's wearing a mask, exactly, right. and how yeah. long I can hold my breath. So there you go, Paul. I thank you for your patronage. I hope you enjoy that. There's plenty to eat and plenty to do. Right. Yeah. On. Exactly. You you've become Amish all of a sudden. Yeah. So well done, and uh, and thank you so much for your patronage. And uh, if if any of you guys want to be a patron of this fine show, you can do so by going to our website, uh, howtoheretic.com. Click on the stuff, go to the place, do the things, and then you give us money. And that's the best thing you can do. Uh, or you can also go on to, uh, you know, one of your various places, your iTunes, po- your podcast app, your Stitcher, whatever, and give us a review. And if you write a review, if you actually happen to write a review... Uh, as I encourage you to do, uh, you never know. I might read it on the air like I'm doing for this one from Burger Crunch. Holy smokes. <laughs> uh, who says, I finally realized I was in a cult. Unfortunately, it took 57 years. Oh, Oof, Burger oh, Crunch. No. Sorry. Never fear, though. Uncles Dan, Doug, and Mark have brought humor and therapy to help me through the mess. Weird that I'm Thanks, last. Uncles. Weird that I'm last. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> no, that sounds right. Uh, this podcast is the most, is most excellent episode after episode. Thank you so much, Burger Crunch, for that. And, uh, and please don't see us as therapy. That's terrifying. (laughs) But thank, that's awesome. Thank you for that wonderful review. Yes, indeed. Uh, shall we move on and do some more? Let's Let's do do some more. Uncle Doug. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. The brain... (laughs) Must be kept wet. <laughs> from from hard experience, I yeah. know that to be true. Which is why we all record from our hot tubs. That's right. The brain must right. be kept... Then it doesn't matter what the fluid is. No, no, no. Yeah, you just don't want it to dry out because then it cracks. And that's yeah. kind of all I got. Yeah. yeah. I use a lot of uh, chapstick on mine. I use, a lot of, <laughs> I use a lot of brain and nerve tonic. <laughs> So, Uncle Dan, <laughs> <laughs> with that brilliant intro, yeah, I was, I, I was okay. really on the spot there. Sorry, yeah. I am going. I, I am going to launch in and let you guys know that I am a prophet. Mm. Mm. Now, you skeptics probably won't believe me, but God has spoken to me and told me the future. I know what will happen in both the short term and the long term, and both of you should be very ashamed of yourselves. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I, you don't even need to be a prophet to say that. We've talked about it on the air. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> uh, so anyway, your avuncular misdeeds notwithstanding, anyone who wants to join my new 100% absolutely unequivocally true religion can start by sending me money. <laughs> uh, yeah. Once I determine that you've sent me enough, I'll ask God to give me instructions on what to do from there. Those instructions may or may not be about sending more money. Uh, we can't know until we get there, so pony up. Probably. I mean, let's be real. <laughs> uh, there are lots of reasons why someone might want to become a religious leader, uh, a mystic or a prophet. My personal guess, because I'm charitable like Jesus, is that most start out as you know, relatively decent people who deep down just want to feel important and powerful and Maybe make a little bit of money along the way. There are sincere ones who honestly, who are honestly trying to help others. And there are cynics who are more interested in serving themselves. Mm. You can decide for yourself how many people belong in each category, but it is my entirely unsubstantiated guess that the groups I just described make up the vast majority of people standing in front of a pulpit, pulpit every Sunday. Or, a or pulpit. Saturday or Friday, whatever. But... There are some people who arrive at religious leadership and or mysticism and or whatever with a different story. Uh, these people are these are people who can honestly tell you that they have experienced something far outside of normal human experience. Mm. They come to their prophetship or prophetdom? 
propheticism? Prof- anyway. Prof- prof- propheticalism. I think yes, that's indeed. It. That's the uh, Latin anyway. Right. Uh, they come to it through powerful encounters with the divine. Now, for the purposes of this segment, I'm going to talk about... I'm not going to talk about charlatans who claim to have had mystical experiences that led them into a priestly calling. Mm. We should talk uh, about that on the show one time, though. Someday we'll get to Let's it. Let's put a pin in that. That's okay. a good idea. Yeah, it's not, a bad, it's not a bad idea for a segment. We should have, we should have thought of that before. Yeah. Or a whole podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, no, we're not talking about those guys who... You know, who claim to have had mystical experiences that led them to a priestly calling, but are just using a bullshit story to fleece innocent dupes. They obviously exist uh, and are likely fairly ubiquitous, though it's impossible to know how common they actually are. Today, I want to talk about people who have had genuine, seemingly supernatural experiences that led them to where they were. Mm. The problem with this topic is that there are way too many variables to know what has actually happened to another person and what hasn't. Right. First of all, many of the people that we're going to talk to speculate about are dead. Hmm. Can't run no tests on dead folks. So uh, everything that we talk about here... Well, I beg to differ. You can run all kinds of tests on dead folks because they (laughs) they don't know. Not if if their bodies don't even exist anymore. Okay. Uh, Fair Uh, enough. So everything that we talk about here, uh, while based on science, will be guesswork when it's applied to most actual people. Mm. Uh, With that said, there are some very real kinds of experiences that humans have all the time that could lead them to believe for certain that there is a spiritual, mystical, or supernatural realm, and they have experienced it. Mm. I'll start with a story about a friend of mine. Uh, She is an artist and a professor. And I've known her on and off since we were about junior high aged. Uh, About a decade ago, she and I were chatting and she confided in me that she had visions of angels. Hmm. Now, she didn't know what to make of them, but they happened. I asked a few questions, but it was clear she was a little bit uncomfortable with the conversation. So we didn't get too far. What we did get to uh, were two points that I thought were fascinating. One. She was not willing to dismiss the phenomenon as mere hallucinations. And two, she knew that the experiences were caused by, or at least spurred on by, her temporal lobe epilepsy. Hmm. Oh, she was, a, she was aware of, her condi- of that condition. She was. Yeah. <clears throat> and woof, she is not alone. People all over this great flat earth of ours uh, report similar events when they have seizures in the temporal lobes of their brain. Hmm. And to be honest, it sometimes sounds pretty amazing. Uh, The simplified version of how this works is this. When someone has a seizure, it's kind of like there's a little lightning storm in their brain. Uh, It can be localized to one part of the brain or zap all through the whole thing. Our brains are like extremely elaborate electronic circuit boards and they operate by shooting electronic signals through specific pathways if you want to raise your coffee cup to your lips your brain sends signals to your hand arm shoulder eyes mouth etc at the same time it's processing a shit ton of incoming signals about how heavy the cup is temperature of the liquid smells etc it's an insanely complex dance and it is beautiful yeah during a seizure however A whole bunch of the neurons that are normally incredibly precise just start firing like crazy. This can cause the intense muscle spasms that most of us associate with epilepsy. PSA, don't ever put something in someone's mouth when they're having a seizure. They hate that. Um, Especially not your fingers. You could be in real trouble. Well, just don't put anything in their mouths. You wouldn't want strangers putting things in your mouth, so don't put anything in there. <laughs> okay. Uh, Speak for yourself. Well, no, people, <laughs> pe- for a long time, people no. thought that that's what you're supposed to no, do. No, I know. Is, yeah. It's like, you know, get a get a belt in there, get a piece of, you know, whatever. No, don't we have a relative with a seizure disorder. We're, we're, all, we're all down with the epilepsy thing. <clears throat> awesome. Yeah. Um, but I will say this. The full tonic-clonic, what used to be called grand mal seizure, is actually less common uh, as a kind of seizure. There uh, there are lots of ways that seizures can play out. One of those ways is that people like my friend experience mild hallucinations or sometimes not mild hallucinations. Hmm. 
But along with those hallucinations can come some deeply spiritual feelings. People report feeling like deep universal truths are revealed to them during these episodes. One woman I read about talked about understanding the interconnectivity of the universe. One guy said it felt like someone was feeding beliefs into his brain through a wire. Mm. Many report feelings of joy or well-being, even if the immediate experience was scary at the time. Mm. Some talk about hearing voices. Some have even felt that they encountered God. Now, we don't know much about why this happens. We do know that the temporal lobe is associated with religiousness in some way. Um, a company, a accomplished neuroscientist V.S. Ramachandran uh, did a fascinating experiment where he tested people's galvanic response, that's uh, skin electricity, to various images. He found that when testing people's response to images of normal objects like a pen or a comb, that they unsurprisingly didn't have much of a gal galvanic spike. Mm -hmm. Then, when they saw violent or horrific images, you know, big response. For people with temporal lobe epilepsy, there were two unique findings. The first was that their response to sexual imagery was very low. Don't know why, but uh, when showed images of a cross or a star of David or even just the word God or Jesus, the shit went through the roof. Hmm. Somehow, when you hyper-excite that, that temporal lobe, one possible response is religion. Hmm. Now, if you were raised with no religious beliefs, and this happens to you, you're likely to just have what could be termed a, a spiritual experience with no particular dogmatic associations. If, however, you're already steeped in a religious framework, well, it's about to get very real for you. This is known as hyper-religiosity uh, in clinical circles and is associated with a condition called Geschwind syndrome. Hmm. Uh, they are cause, the, there are causes of hyper-religiosity that aren't to do with epilepsy too, uh, but se seizures seem to be a major portion of the cases. Hmm. And here's what's so vexing about it. Even when these people know that they have this condition that is associated with this symptom... The feelings and experiences that they're left with are so powerful and so real for them that they frequently conclude that they actually had a brush with the supernatural and the seizure was just the conduit for it. Hmm. Um, there are extreme cases of this. One case involved a 40-year-old man, uh, for instance, who was admitted to the hospital. He had gone off his seizure medications and was absolutely convinced that all the doctors and nurses were trying to prevent him from ha attaining salvation. He was a Muslim and kept saying things like, God is with me and I do not need doctors or medications. The same, so the things he experienced through his seizures were more real to him than the trained professionals around him. Wow. Now, imagine if he had experienced those same symptoms 50 years earlier. When right. he might have been thrown into an insane asylum. Right. Or 590 years earlier. Right. Or, or 1,440 years earlier. Or 2,000 or 2,400 years earlier. Why those specific amounts of years? You ask, uncles. Well, <laughs> you sillies. That's because when that's when a few famous people throughout history uh, who very likely might have suffered from the same condition lived. Now, 590 years ago, a young peasant girl in France was helping Charles VII become king after visits from the Archangel Michael, St. Margaret, and St. Catherine of Alexandria. The voices that Joan of Arc heard and the events that she described surrounding those visits were consistent with tempor temporal lobe epilepsy. Hmm. As were the visitations 1440-ish years ago of Archangel Gabriel to a 40-year-old guy in a cave outside the city of Mecca. Mm -hmm. a, study, a study of descriptions of Muhammad from the Hadith uh, have led scholars to, and scientists to say that he likely had the same types of seizures. Hmm. Uh, seizures are certainly possible in the case of a certain moment for St. Paul as he minded his own business while traveling, down, uh, traveling on a business trip to Damascus. Uh, and you'll remember... 
a couple of a couple of weeks ago when I talked about demons. Well, we get that word from the Latin word daemon, which comes from the Greek word daimon, which means roughly deity. Well, one ancient Greek was apparently <clears throat> visited by a daimonian, which translates just a divine something. Uh, this was a voice that would warn him about mistakes he was making. Socrates didn't believe in the gods of his time but was f and was forced to drink poison because of the spiritual entity that he did believe in, which was probably just an audio hallucination caused by his brain going zappy every now and then. Mm -hmm. So, while there are plenty of lying assholes out there looking to fleece a bunch of sheep, mm. let's take a moment to spare a thought for those who are genuinely convinced that, they have, that they're having a divine encounter. You know, because yeah. their brains go on the fritz. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's a that's it's a it's a great point that there are people who truly believe they have had these um, divine visitations and visions and and heard voices and you know, like Joan of Arc would probably go ahead and get set on fire, not denying them, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we it's so easy for for we uh, snooty atheists to dismiss the religious uh, experiences of others, not knowing that, you know, whether or not they actually, they may have had some very profound experience that isn't what they thought it was, but, uh, but is nevertheless still uh, vitally important to them. Yeah, for sure. No, that's, uh, that's really fascinating. And, you know, we've, we've talked plenty about what we would consider, I mean, we would consider all of them to be false prophets, technically, correct? But uh, but people that are just total shysters, we've talked about yeah. plenty of times on the show. But it's really an interesting phenomenon that that there are those people who are like, no, this actually fucking happened. I saw this, and including your friend who knew why she was seeing the things she was seeing. Yep. But still found them kind of profound experiences, right? Yeah, and and I can understand why when someone experiences something that feels deeply profound, that feels like they've gotten some sort of access to knowledge or information that they never had before. Their brain has made connections that, you know, that are well beyond anything that they had ever, that they had ever thought before. I can understand saying, and plus literally visually seeing beings external from <clears throat> yourself yeah. with your own eyes or hearing them with your own ears. I can understand thinking maybe something, maybe this is more than just me. Maybe this is bigger than just me. Maybe something mm -hmm. real is happening. I don't know if we've talked about this on the show before, but I am a, I've talked about being a migraine sufferer. Mm. And um, they've kind of come and gone through the course of my life. But there is, with the latest batch, there is a very occasional thing that happens. I think it's happened two or three times <clears throat> where after it's passed... There is a an absolutely real set of experiences in my head, a set of memories that I just I'm like, oh, this is I don't remember remember I don't remember these things happening, and when huh. I think about them for a while, I'm like, well, that never so. For instance, I I literally had a memory as like it really happened, like we're talking right now, that Barack Obama called me and said, hey, do you want to go to the Kings game with me? <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh, fuck, I'm in Toronto, but let me see if I can, like, figure it out. Yeah, I'd love to, dude. Let's, I haven't seen you in a long... Like, I've never met Barack Obama. Right. As far as I know, he does not have my telephone number. <laughs> I have no interest in seeing the L.A. Kings fucking hockey team, but it, I'd certainly go with him. That'd be fun. But it was as real as real could be. And it took me, like, 24 hours to convince myself it hadn't happened. Right? Wow. So and I'm, I'm your rational Uncle Mark. And but there it was because of a, a you know a, a neurological condition. There was a memory that was as real as any other I've ever had in my head, yeah. and I had to you know go back through my life to convince myself no that didn't happen. Well, you know, memory and brains are far more plastic and uh, malleable than we want them than we want to admit that they are. Yeah, this and is I, a, a similar experience, but very not from a. Um, a migraine or something like that, but I had a dream. In my dream, um, a friend of mine murdered somebody mm. and reached out to me and I helped my friend 
dispose of the body. I think we wrapped it in a carpet and I put it in a dumpster. I think we've admitted to enough on this show this week. <laughs> right? I mean, it was, it was a bad dream, obviously. But in the dream, I went home and went to bed. And then I woke up in real life. And it wasn't a long time, but it was a scary few minutes considering what I had just done. Yeah. Right. Until I, I'm like, oh, my God, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. But f- but my memory of it was very vivid and very clear, um, and and that's just a dream. I'm I, I'm agreeing with you, Uncle Dan, that the that memory is such a fickle mistress. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I think- it's one of those things. It's it. Our brains are so fucked up that I'm actually I've actually become convinced that eyewitness testimony should always be taken with a deep grain of salt. It should not be like it's the slam dunk that every prosecutor wants. And mm-hmm. we, as a society, should be abandoning eyewitness testimony as almost worthless. That's yep. what the science around eyewitness testimony says now. Yeah. Right? Is it's, It is incredibly unreliable. Like, I, I um, uh, somebody threw a rock through my neighbor's front window a few weeks ago, right? And um, I, had, I had seen one person walking by, somebody just, anyway, and when the police came, I started describing what I felt like I had seen. And then I just started realizing, I don't think I really got that good a look at him. Right. Mm. You know, I think I'm relying on what I heard other people say. And I was right. Like the person that I had in my mind's eye was not the person that when they looked at the security camera was not the person who did it. Right. And it was just, that was like minutes later, 20 minutes later. Right. So memory's weird. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so and the human brain can manufacture amazing things and maybe you know i maybe we'll have to i'll have to do a, a segment maybe next week or or sometime soon about other ways in which our human brains can be uh can be convinced that they've ex- that they've had a religious experience when indeed no i mean you know the person has experienced something <clears throat> profound and religious but it wasn't from anything but your own silly little brain. Well, yeah. we joke about that. We, we one time on the show, or it's actually several times, we've talked about what it would take to believe again. And um, I, I, one of us, it might have been me, said something to the effect of, "If I had, if I actually saw an angel descend from heaven and speak to me, the first thing I would do would be to go to the hospital." Yeah, because the most likely scenario is that my complex and very imperfect brain is playing tricks on me. Yeah. Go, go, go get, you know, have him look under the hood and if everything's okay, then be like, all right, now I have to reconsider this. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but we talked about this when we talked about the religious experience along, I can't remember what episode and, and the God helmet, how they were able to stimulate parts of the brain at the frontal lobe, I guess, Dan, to um, have people experience deep spiritual feelings. And some of them, a small number even felt like they felt the presence of God in the room. Um, right. When I was reading up on that, there are there was a study of Vietnam veterans who had suffered a very particular sort of brain trauma, and for the rest of their lives, they felt like they were experiencing some sort of divine presence, etc. Right, spiritual experiences. So, and why would you want to take that away? Like, the, you know, if you have that experience, if you, you know, if 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 you had a brain trauma, and then from then on, something that felt beautiful was happening happening to you. I I think it I can see why a lot of people would be like, yeah, you're not going to convince me otherwise. I love that thing. I don't want it to go away. Yeah. But I mean the 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 son of Sam, right? That that's the counter example. He was 100% convinced that a dog told him to kill people. Didn't he didn't he recant that? I seem to I don't know. I think he said oh I made that all up, but I can't remember exactly. But yeah. I mean the point being that not all of these experiences are you know are beautiful. Some of them are scary or some of them push sure. people in bad directions. Yeah. Sure. Uh yeah. I you know if it points people to uh you know magical mystical beliefs, religious beliefs, I say that's a bad direction. I say you're getting you're getting bad info, bro. Or if I it, agree. you know, if it causes you to foment basically a French civil war and then you end up getting burned to death, it's, you know, <laughs> yeah. Think maybe it, th- it didn't serve you as well as you were hoping. Think it through a little bit. Right. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, that's, uh, that is frontal lobe ep- epilepsy, I guess. No, that's temporal lobe Temporal lobe epilepsy. Jeez, sorry. And uh, yeah, it's, it's not in the front. It's on the sides. So uh, keep, keep your brains in check and let's move on. Yeah, I got to go because I've got, got to hit the Kings game with Barack Obama. So talk to you guys later. <laughs> All right. Bye. 
Well, friends, that is it for this week's show. Hey, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you've ever had a machete in your head, send us an email at howto at howtoheretic.com. Or if you ever accidentally started a French Civil War, uh, leave us a voicemail about it, 903-88-HOW-TO, which is at 903-884-6986. I'm also on Twitter at howtoheretic. And thanks again to our awesome patrons. And thanks to our patron, St. Cody Layton, for editing the show. And thank you, dear friends, for tuning in. Bye, friends. Arrivederci. Arrivederci.